So uh, let's open our sermon notebooks. Let's keep our Bibles open to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We finished 1 Thessalonians this morning. Uh, kids, you might want to uh, grab a piece of paper, grab a pencil. You might want to draw a picture during this time. Uh, you might already have the Lego set out, ready to be making something uh, that springs to your mind as you hear God's word proclaimed this morning. Uh, but for all of us, let me pray. Uh, our great God and heavenly Father, we thank you that you are not like the gods of stone and wood. Uh, you are not like the gods uh, of rock or the gods of sun and moon that people have made because uh, you are the God who hears and you are the God who speaks. And we ask now, our great God, that you would speak to us and that you would open our ears, that we might hear what it is that you have to say. And uh, our gracious God, we pray that you would enable me, your servant, to speak your word with all boldness, and that you would stretch out your hand to heal, and that signs and wonders would be performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Amen. Uh, well, here's where we're going this morning. If you're a note-taking kind of person, uh, we're thinking uh, again about expressing holiness. And you remember that really the whole back half of 1 Thessalonians, chapters 4 and 5, has been all about expressing holiness. What does it look like to live as God's people, saved by His grace, transformed by His Spirit, fully convicted? And holiness means just being different to the people around you, to the world around you, which is you know, sinful and under the rule of Satan. What does it mean to be holy and to be like God, being different from others and being like God? Because God is holy and he calls us to be holy as well. And we've seen lots of different ways uh, that God's people are to be holy. And uh, what we're going to see today is that as Paul closes his letter, his first letter to them, we're going to see that holiness and expressing holiness uh, means holding on to the gospel, means holding on to the gospel. Now, uh, as Christians, I think we often think that holiness, godliness, sanctification uh, is about being in a scrum. Now, I'm, I'm not a particularly sporty guy, in terms of team sports, I love to swim. That's my thing because everybody leaves me alone. I don't have to talk to anyone. I don't have to look at anyone. There's no noise coming in my ears. It's just me and ideally the ocean. Often it's me and, uh, and the pool down at Hornsby swimming laps. Uh, at the moment, it's just, you know, like me having longer showers trying to remember what it's like uh, to swim. But... I know enough about rugby and I've watched enough games to know that there's this thing called a scrum. And uh, the scrum, it's kind of a way of getting the ball back really, but what a scrum is, is you get like six or seven uh, men or women, because you know, both play rugby, and you get your arms around each other and both teams do it, both sides, and then at, any, at a given moment when the ref says, they kind of lock heads together. Both teams, they kind of go, Brr, and they try and push each other and someone feeds the ball in underneath and then they, they get their feet and, you know. Now, we often think that holiness, sanctification, is, about, is like being in a scrum with Jesus. Because you, you remember a few months ago, we talked about how salvation is monogistic, which means that God alone does it, He saves. But salvation is synergistic. It's us working with God. And we think, oh, well, if we're working with Jesus on our sanctification, then it's like a scrum. You know, I get my arm around Jesus and I get my arm around someone else. <laughs> and we lock heads together. We lock heads, you know, with sin and death and the devil. Now, the problem with a scrum, though, is uh, if someone folds in on the scrum, the whole scrum collapses because <laughs> we're all in it together. Me, Jesus, you, locking heads. Uh, but what we're going to see this morning 
is that Paul leaves the Thessalonians with the gospel and the gospel is that sanctification or holiness is not like being in a scrum with Jesus. There's no arms around each other. There's no locking heads. So come with me. Have a, let's have a look at verses 23 and 24. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Now I want you to notice that Paul has just said to the Thessalonians in verse 22, abstain from every form of evil. That's, an, that's a command. Abstain from every form of evil. And in the very next breath... He says, may the God of peace himself sanctify you. Our sanctification, our holiness, our walking in the Christian life, Paul says, is God's work. It is God's work. He will surely do it. It is God's work to sanctify us completely so that we are kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's God's business. And Paul says, verse 24, he is faithful to do it. And here is the gospel, here is the good news for the Thessalonians in their pursuit of holiness in their abstaining from evil in their holding fast to what is good here is the good news for them that that sanctification is not like a scrum sanctification is not me with my arm around Jesus and if one of us collapses then the whole thing collapses Yes, I'm involved, but Jesus is the one who will do it in the end. He is faithful. He will do it. He is the God of peace and he will sanctify us. Holiness is not like a scrum. Holiness is like sitting on someone's shoulders. Yes, we're both doing it, but I, in my holiness, I am like a little child sitting on the shoulders of Jesus Christ. And he is the one who will carry me through. And yes, I'm there. Yes, I'm growing in holiness. Yes, I'm abstaining from evil and holding fast to what is good. I'm trying not to quench the spirit. I'm trying to exhort others like we heard last week. I'm trying to listen to other people's exhortations and admonishments of me. But in the end, I am like a toddler sitting on the shoulders of Jesus Christ. And he is the faithful one. He is the one who will present me blameless when he returns. And this is just such good news. Because if if sanctification is like a scrum, if I collapse it, the whole thing collapses. (laughs) But if salvation is me sitting on the shoulders of Jesus, well, I can fall all over the place. I mean, I've carried my kids on my shoulders, right? When they're little toddlers and they're like this. Whoa! They're like reaching down and hitting their heads on stuff and falling over and trying to grab the light globes as I, as I walk through the house. And, but I hold on to them and they don't fall off. And that's what Paul is saying to the Thessalonians. It is the God of peace who will sanctify us, friends. And he is faithful. And he has called us and he will do it. And that is good news for us this morning. And he will do it completely. Now, I want to think a little bit about this phrase 
that the whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord. Now, big picture is that Paul is saying uh, he is praying and he believes that God is faithful to keep the whole person blameless, the whole person holy and sanctified. He is able to work on the whole person. But it is interesting that he uses these three different terms, spirit, soul and body. And so I just thought, look, we might just have a little think about what the Bible teaches about what we are as human beings. And I've just got a couple of verses that I want to read out. Uh, Luke chapter 10, verse 27. This is Jesus. He answers the Pharisee. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, first thing I want to just point out there is that Jesus himself teaches us that uh, there is more to us than just our physical bodies. Paul here in 1 Thessalonians 5 is just echoing what Jesus teaches in the Gospels, which there are different parts to us. Hearts, souls, strength, mind. And whatever we might make of any one of those things, you know, they thought the heart was a particular thing. We might think the heart does something different. But whatever you make of it, both Jesus and Paul are teaching us that human beings are more than just this kind of physical body that we have. We're more than just the kind of physical chemicals that our brain produces. I mean, we, we talk about, I felt it in my guts. We talk about, you know, someone broke my heart. And, and Jesus actually reflects this in his own life. Matthew 26. Uh, this is the, the, the story of Jesus in the garden at Gethsemane. Taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. Jesus says, My soul is very sorrowful. Jesus identifies this part of him that is deeply sorrowful. Now, but he, he, he kind of doesn't mean his physical body is very sorrowful. His physical body expresses that sorrow by sweating drops of blood, we're told uh, later in uh, Luke's gospel. But Jesus says he has a soul. Now, what's a soul? Well, I think... Uh, the best way to understand our soul, and this is kind of a, this is a general way of speaking, right? This isn't true for every time you read soul in your, body, in your Bible. But I, I think biblically, generally, the soul is the part of a person that is us, which is encased, it is in our physical body, but it is not... Um, kind of dependent on our physical body right that's our soul we might call it a personality a character it's kind of who i am i'm mike with with all of the things that make up me and and my body and my soul are here together right now but my soul and my body are also not the same thing and here's how i know um Imagine you cut off one of my arms. Please take my left arm first because I'm right-handed. Uh, but imagine you cut off my left arm and let's call that let's call that 15% of my body mass, right? Now I'm 15% less I'm body mass, right? I'm down on body mass. But if you cut off my arm, you don't cut off 15% of my soul, do you? Now, let's imagine that, you know, you're being generous and you leave me my right arm, but you take both my legs right, as well as my left arm. We're kind of getting into that Monty Python scene where, you know, cutting off different parts of the body and it's all okay. Let's call my legs like another 15%. So between this arm and these two legs, you've, you've cut off 45% of my body mass. But you haven't taken 45% of my soul, have you? Because our, our soul is in our bodies, but it, it's in some 
deep, mysterious, God only knows kind of way. It's contained in us, but not dependent on us. And yet the funny thing is that we know that when the whole body dies, the person is not there anymore. When my body, when I die, my brain switches off, my heart stops beating. That soul, it it won't be here anymore. So the soul, I think, generally is that part of me uh, that makes me, me, and you, you, and is contained in this body, and yet at the same time is not kind of dependent on it. Now, what's the spirit? Well, Romans 8.16, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Now, I think every person has a spirit And sometimes in the Bible, the spirit and the soul are almost synonymous. They almost mean the same thing. But I think there is um, some kind of help in the Bible, particularly here in Romans 8, to see that the spirit is me relating to God. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth, says John in John chapter 4. And so our spirits are the parts of us that interact with God and we must worship him in spirit and here Paul says the spirit himself bears witness with our spirits that we are children of God so there's a there's a contact between our spirit and God who is spirit and look really the big picture that I just want to say this morning (laughs) Firstly, is that Paul's point is that God is faithful and what he will do is sanctify every single part of us. Your whole spirit, your whole soul, our whole body. But I, th- I just want to just remind us as well that the Bible is just so very clear that human beings are more than, than just physical beings. We are physical beings, but we are more than that. We have souls. We have spirits. You know, I am more than just the chemicals that run around my brain. I am, I am not a computer. And I've had conversations with people who, who flat out believe that human beings are just computers. That love, that memory, that affection, that hope, it's just all chemicals flying round the brain, that personality, that character, it's just all physical. And, and, and Jesus and Paul and the other writers of the Bible say, no, that is not true. We have a soul, we have a spirit. You have a soul and a spirit. You are more than just this machine that lives in the world, my friends. And the good news for us, the gospel for us this morning, is that God will sanctify every single part of us. Uh, Well, let's press on. There's more gospel news. Verse 25, Paul says, Brothers, pray for us. And, uh, you know, we want to be a prayerfully dependent church here at St. Luke's. And I, I was so struck this week that Paul calls the Thessalonians to pray. When we pray, we are depending on Jesus. Prayer is a humbling thing. It's 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 a moment or a time every day where we get on our knees and we say, Jesus, you are God and I am not and I need things in this world and I'm going to ask you for them and I'm going to thank you for what you've given me. And I'm going to cry out to you for others. Prayer is dependence on Jesus. The word just means to ask. You know, if you ever watched um, those kind of Jane Austen period dramas, you'll know that someone will be sitting at the dinner table and they'll say, you know, pray thee, can you pass the salt? You know, pray thee, can I have some more gravy? And it's just like, I'm just asking you, can you pass me the salt? That's what the word means in the end. And that's Biblically, what we should think of when we think of prayer. It's just asking God for stuff. You can ask God for stuff. And Paul says, ask God for stuff. 
Ask it for yourself and ask it for others. Isn't it amazing that the Apostle Paul says, pray for us? Because, you know, you think of all the people in the world, if there was going to be someone in the world who didn't need people's prayers, it's going to be Paul. Amazing Paul. And yet even Paul asks for them to pray. And you know what? The Christian privilege is that we can pray and call God our Father. And that is just such good news. It's good news for for these Christians. It's good news for me. It's good news for you this morning. That you can come into the presence of God through the person of Jesus Christ, trusting in His name, bearing His name, that you can walk with confidence into the throne room of grace and find grace and find mercy and find your Father ready to listen. He wants to listen to you, to hear what you have to ask Him, to hear your cries, to hear your hurts, to hear your hopes and your dreams. So brothers and sisters, pray because it is such good news that we can. When we pray, we talk to the God who created the whole universe. That is good news. Well, Paul then says that we should greet one another with a holy kiss. Well, Paul wasn't living in a coronavirus world, was he? That's for sure. This is a bit of a strange one. But what I want to show you is that, um, that the gospel even transforms our kissing. The gospel transforms our kissing. Now, let me tell you uh, what I think Paul is doing here and then what I think it means for us. Um, One of the things that happens when you teach people, and I have it all the time, is when I preach publicly, people will often come to me afterwards and say, oh, so you said this, um, so I've gone and done this. Is that the right thing to do? Um, And sometimes I say yes, and sometimes I have to say, oh, look, no, I don't think that's quite what I meant. Um, I think it actually might look like something different. It's not that they, well, maybe they did misunderstand me, maybe they misheard me, or maybe just something got lost in translation. Um, And we actually see this happening for Paul. It happens in 1 Corinthians uh, where we read um, Paul teaching the church um, that they actually don't need to separate themselves from Christians but actually separate themselves from each other when there's sexual immorality. I think it's chapter 6. And what seems to have happened is that Paul taught them um, before he wrote 1 Corinthians, he taught them that they should not associate with people who are committing sexual immorality. Now what they heard was, oh, anyone who's being sexually immoral, we can't have anything to do with. And and Paul in his letter of 1 Corinthians says, no, 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 I didn't mean the world. I meant other Christians. And I think the similar thing he's preempting here. Because you remember back in chapter 4, verse 3, Paul says, this is the will of God, your sanctification that you abstain from sexual immorality. Now, they might have heard that and thought, oh, okay, well, we're meant to abstain from sexual immorality. And that means that there should be no physical contact between men and women. Now, the thing was, um, in the day that this is written, giving someone a kiss was a way of saying hi. I mean, in, uh, in Australia at the moment, I mean, we just keep our hands in our pockets when we meet one another so that we don't have to shake hands. Some bold people do the uh, elbow. I just... Someone did that to me on Friday morning. I do not think it's going to catch on. I really hope it doesn't catch on. But we're used to shaking hands, right? And uh, we had this funny season where it became a way of greeting one another in Australia that you would kind of give them a kiss or a hug. But that's just not... It always felt a little funny and who knew the rules around it and I just never knew how to process it. But in some cultures, even today, oh, there is hearty kissing on the cheek. Like between men, between women, there's two kisses. Some countries, they have three kisses, mwah, 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 on each side. Some on the forehead, mwah. And uh, in, in uh, Asia Minor, where Paul is writing to, they would greet each other with a kiss, right? But so that they don't misunderstand Paul when he talks about 
them being sanctified and abstaining from sexual immorality, he says, no, no, you should greet each other with a kiss still. It's just that your kiss is holy now. Your kiss is holy. It's to look different. It's to be different. Not in the way you kiss someone, but in, in the greeting, but it's to look different in that your attitude toward this person is now different. When you greet them, you greet them as a brother and sister in Christ. They're, not a, uh, they're kind of not available for you sexually. You know, the, the greeting kiss is not to be used as a tool for sexual immorality now. It's a holy kiss that you give to one another. You see, when we're following Jesus, there are, there are things that we stop doing, there are things that we start doing, and there are things that we do differently with a different attitude. When you start following Jesus, you know, we stop stealing, we stop swearing, uh, we stop getting drunk, we stop speeding in our cars whole bunch of things we stop doing. And there are things that we start doing. We start reading our Bibles. We start praying. We start serving in church. We start uh, being pursuing sanctification and holiness and righteousness. All the things we've been hearing about. And there are things that we keep doing, but we do them with a different attitude now. We follow Jesus. We keep going to work. But we work as those who work for Jesus. And so we do a good job. We keep going to sport, but because we follow Jesus, we're good sports people. We love one another and we love our you know, opponents on the, on the pitch. We still go shopping as Christians, but our shopping is no longer you know, the means for us to fill this hole in our lives with products to make us feel better about ourselves. Shopping becomes about providing for my own needs and the needs of my family. And Paul's saying, we still greet one another, but we just do it in a holy way now, acknowledging that you are a member of the body of Christ, I am a member of the body of Christ, we belong to Jesus, and we're going to be holy together. Now, I just want to encourage you, I think one of the lessons for us here is to, let's be genuine in our greetings I think sometimes I've met men who, when they want to shake your hand, you really just get this sense that it's a contest in masculinity. You know, who can break the person's fingers first? Not every man, but some men. And, and men, can I just say to us, our greetings to one another are not to be contests in masculinity. They're meant to be moments of genuine affection and and acknowledgement, hey, you're here, and it is, it's great to see you. And uh, I think sometimes for women, greetings can be just as ungenuine or disingenuous. Whether they're shaking hands or, you know, giving a kiss or a little hug, or sometimes it can just, you just get this vibe that, yes, this person is, is giving me a, a peck on the cheek, but I'm not really sure how they feel about me. <laughs> I've seen it in movies. You know, it's the kind of really fake person at its most extreme. But we want to be genuine in our greetings as Christians, remembering that our greetings are holy. All right, verse 27, Paul says, We are to read, I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. And what he's saying is that the good news is that everyone has access to God now. The good news is that in Christ, by the Spirit, God has spoken to the world. He speaks through the words of the apostles. He speaks through His Son. And everybody should have access to what God has to say. So He says, read the letter to everyone. Don't just give it to one person in particular and say, hey, look, I really think this is meant for you. You need to really hear this stuff. But also, the reason you've got to have it read to everyone is because some people can't read. How are they going to know God's, how are they going to know what God has to say to them? How are they going to grow in holiness if no one reads it to them? Because they can't read. So the the letters of Paul are meant for everyone, not just for the person that you know, we might think is sinful. And, it, and it's not just for the people who can read. 
God's word is for everyone. And that's why when we gather together every week, we just read parts of the Bible. We read books of the Bible all the way through, just one after the other. And uh, you might wonder, like, why are we reading Nehemiah? Because Nehemiah is God's word, has things to say to us, has lessons to teach us. And it's really important that every member of St. Luke's has the chance to hear the word of God in Nehemiah. It's the same reason that we read the Bible from 1 Thessalonians and then as a, at a different point, I preach on it. Because we, we want to hear God's word read. And you know, not everyone in our church can read very well. And we want to be a church here at St. Luke's that is available for every person of every level of education. And some of our kids can't read yet. That's okay. They can hear God's word. Maybe there are adults in our church, people who will join our church in the future who can't read. We want them to have full access to God's word. And so Paul wants uh, that for the Thessalonians as well. And so he commands them to read the letter. Finally, finally, verse 28, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. The last kind of point of good news that Paul gives to the Thessalonians is that Jesus is gracious. Jesus is gracious filled with grace and he wants that grace to be with them grace is just generosity that's what the word means a generous gift and he says now may the generosity of jesus be with you what he wants for them is that they remember that jesus is generous all of their salvation all of their lives it is all his gift and his constant working in them, his constant activity in them. He is the faithful one. He is the one who will do it, not because of works, not because of who they are, but because he is gracious and generous. So brothers and sisters, live on grace. Live on grace. Let let grace be the oxygen that you breathe this week. When you wake up in the morning, just think Jesus is gracious. And that is why I exist. That is why I am saved. That is why I'm one of God's children. And when you put your head on the pillow at night, think Jesus, you are gracious. And you have sustained me through this day. You've given me breath in my lungs and thought in my brain. You've given me forgiveness of my sin for the wrong things that I've done. The good things that I've done have been done in you and all because of your generosity. And Paul wants the Thessalonians to live and breathe grace. And so brothers and sisters, let us live and breathe grace this week. Because that's the gospel. That's the gospel. The gospel that Paul leaves them with. The gospel is not Jesus wants to forgive your sins if you want it to, if you want him to. That's not the gospel. The gospel is is that Jesus is God and he is gracious. The gospel is that Jesus is God and God has raised him up and exalted him to the highest place that God calls sinners out of darkness, out of sin, into his light so that he might sanctify them, he might change them, so that he might bring them together in a family. And all by grace. That's the gospel. That we can pray. That we can hear God speak. That we can be made holy. That's the gospel. And what do we do in response to that? 
Well, we were we repent of our sin and we believe the good news. That's the gospel, friends. The Lord Jesus Christ is with us. We belong to him. So live that, breathe that this week. Make it the oxygen of our lives. Let's make it the oxygen of our church. Uh, Lord Jesus, we thank you for your grace. And I pray now that your grace would be at work powerfully in each and every one of us. As we sit in our living rooms, in our beds, in our kitchens, Jesus, would your grace be working, sanctifying, making us holy. We sit on your shoulders, Jesus, and we trust you. You are the faithful one. And more and more, more and more would you work in us and carry us forward to that great day when you come and we stand before you blameless in holiness. Praise you, Jesus. Amen. All right, well, we're going to go to a song. and then we- uh, Well, got one question that's come in via text. I'll just read it out. How do you deal with God's response to prayer when his response is not as you asked for? So that's a really question about unanswered prayer or when he answers it in a different way than what you asked. And unanswered prayer, can I just encourage you, uh, unanswered prayer is the experience of every follower of Jesus and was the experience of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Okay? uh, Luke chapter 22, verse 41, he withdrew from them about a stone's throw away and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, If you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will but yours be done. Did you hear it? There is his, he asks his father to remove the cup from him. And and God the father said no to God the son. So the Lord Jesus had at least one of his prayers. I think probably only one of his prayers, but one of his prayers went unanswered. And he was faithful, wasn't he? He was faithful in not being given what he asked for, but still being obedient to his heavenly Father. And I think there's the first lesson for us that sometimes we ask for things uh, for ourselves or for others. Sometimes God says no, and we need to learn from Jesus and, and ref, like follow Jesus in being faithful to what we do know God wants us to do, even when he's said no to our prayers. And the Lord Jesus knew that the cross stood before him and that that was his father's will, that he should lay down his life for his sheep. And Jesus was faithful and trustworthy. And for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. So I think the first thing I want to say is, uh, if God has not answered your prayers or even answered them in ways that you find strange or different, then be encouraged. Uh, You're in good company and learn from Jesus. The second thing I want to say is that um, Luke chapter 18, Jesus tells his disciples a parable uh, in verse, chapter 18, verse 1, uh, he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. One of the reasons God says no to our prayers is because he wants us to pray and not lose heart. He wants us to be steadfast in prayer, is what Paul calls it. Be steadfast in prayer, Romans chapter 12. And sometimes God just wants us to keep praying. <laughs> Keep asking. It's not that he said no. He's like completely, he said no, not right now. You be steadfast in prayer. And so can I just encourage you? Keep praying. Keep asking the Lord. But as you do that, my third encouragement is to ask the Lord if you are asking for the right thing. Because it might be that the longer you pray for something and the more you read your Bible, you realize 
that actually the thing you were praying for was not the right thing to be praying for and you end up not praying for it anymore. And so that might happen as well. So don't just, don't just mo- like monologue to God, but, but have conversation with God in your prayers. God, I'm praying for this. Is this what you want? And where in your word does it show me that that is what you want? So that's my encouragement to you. Uh, Next question. Uh, Don't we still have an obligation to choose to accept God's grace? Uh, Look, I would say, thank you, that's a great question. Don't we still have an obligation to choose to accept God's grace? Um, I would use different language because I think language is important. So I wouldn't use the word choose there. I would use the word respond. Yes, we still need to respond to God's grace. But the way we respond to God's generosity is by trust. It's by faith. Okay? This is the thing. The gospel is that Jesus is king. Jesus is Lord. Mark chapter 1 verse 1, the beginning of the gospel, Jesus Christ, Son of God. Jesus is the Christ, God's king, and he's God's son. And you believe it or you reject it, but it is true. Okay? But it's not like Jesus is offering me a Christmas present. And I say, oh, thank you, Jesus. I will take this. The gospel is just news. And I go, ah, okay. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, God's son. Now, I've also spent a lifetime rejecting that news in lots of different ways. And so one of the the ways I respond is by repentance. Jesus, I'm so sorry. Uh, that I rejected you as God's king and son. I'm so sorry for that. And I'm sorry that I went and then did all this other stuff that ruined my life and ruined other people's lives. So I think um, I would just change that word to responding because I think faith is responding. If you need an image, um, the image Jesus himself uses He says, um, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that anyone who believes in him uh, will not perish. Um, It's interesting that all in that story from the book of Numbers, all the Israelites could do, all they had to do was look at the snake on the pole that Moses set up. You just look at it. You look at it and you're saved. Now looking... That's not even accepting. It's not doing anything, really. It's just fixing your eyes on something. And Jesus says, the person who fixes their eyes on me, they're the person who looks at me. That's the person uh, who will be saved. And so, yes, we still need to respond. But we need to just empty that of all law of all action. We need to empty it of all pride. And my problem with the idea of accepting, and this might not do it for you, but I know that in my heart, accepting just over time just becomes this little moment of pride. Yes, I accepted. And there is no pride. uh, There is no place for pride uh, from us in the kingdom of heaven because we're saved by grace. Um, Final question, why can't we see our soul? That's a super question. Why can't we see our soul? Well, I think much the same way that we can't see our spirit because they're invisible. And uh, they're non-physical. So there are parts of me, parts of you that are physical. This, I can hit it. My soul, my spirit. I can't. (laughs) That's why you can't see God, because God is spirit. And uh, that's why he's invisible. So we can't see our souls because they're not physical, which is why we can't cut them off, why we can't scoop them out. All right. Thanks for those questions. 
uh, feel free to email me or text me during the week if you have other things that come up. But right now,